Hello friends, good evening once again. Uh, welcome to my channel. Today we are going to discuss about the cavities which are present in our brain. We might have heard the word called as ventricles. There are ventricles in the heart. Now we are going to see the ventricles in our brain. Now before going to explore this, please subscribe to my channel. Now coming to the cavities in our brain, there are two ventricles, right and left lateral ventricles, which are present in right and left cerebral hemisphere. So these two hemispheres, they are having consisting of the cavities. They are going to communicate with the third ventricle, which is present in the midline. Now the third ventricle is going to communicate with the fourth ventricle. As we have been discussing about the topics in our neuroanatomy, we have seen many topics, we have listened many classes in the neuroanatomy, and now we have come to the cavities in our brain. Now, first, we'll discuss about the third and fourth ventricles. After that, we'll discuss about the lateral ventricles. So, by the end of the class, you should be able to describe the parts, location, boundaries, extent and relations then we are going to discuss about the choroid plexus communications of the third and fourth ventricle and anatomical base of congenital hydrocephalus now try to observe this particular blue colored structures those are called as lateral ventricles so these lateral ventricles which are present in the right and left cerebral hemispheres respectively now, as you are seeing here, at the midline, we can identify this particular structure called as third ventricle is present at the midline. And that is going to communicate below with the fourth ventricle. Here you can see this purple color one, that is nothing but your fourth ventricle. So this is how third and the fourth ventricles are communicated. Now, after that, that is going to communicate the central canal here. So the central canal, which is present in the spinal cord. And now, how many cavities, how many openings are there in the fourth ventricle? We are all going to discuss about that particular structures. Now, coming to the third ventricle, what is third ventricle? So, it is nothing but a narrow funnel shaped cavity of diencephalon and it is situated between the right and left thalamus and the hypothalamus. Here you can see in this picture, these are thalami and these are hypothalami. Now coming to this third ventricle, where to where it is extending? So it is extending from the lamina terminalis anteriorly and to the superior end of cerebral aqueduct of sylvius of midbrain posteriorly. So anteriorly lamina terminalis and posteriorly aqueduct of sylvius. And it is lined by the ciliated columnar epithelium and ependymal cells and that is traversed by interthalamic adhesion let me show you that now coming to the communications so how it is going to communicate and with which cavities it is going to communicate so this third ventricle this green color one which is which you're seeing here that is going to communicate with the lateral ventricles in the right and left cerebral hemispheres so through a foramen called as interventricular foramen of Monroe, that is called as interventricular foramen of Monroe. And now it is going to communicate with the fourth ventricle, with the fourth ventricle via aqueduct of Sylvius. Coming to the boundaries of the third ventricle, it is a cube like structure with the six boundaries. You can see anterior wall, posterior wall, roof, floor, and here you can see the right. And left lateral walls. Now you are seeing the cube shape here. So it is almost it is the cube shape as the cube has four wall. I mean, uh, six boundaries. Here you can identify the right and left lateral walls, roof, and then here you can see the floor, anterior wall, and here you can see the posterior wall. Now what is the what are the boundaries? Now what is anterior wall? Let us discuss about these six boundaries one by one. First one is anterior wall. So the anterior wall extends from foramen of Monroe. Here you can see the foramen of Monroe uh, superiorly and inferiorly we can identify optic chiasma. 
so superior boundary is interventricular foramen of Monroe and inferiorly we can identify optic chiasma. Now the foramen of Monroe over the structures you can identify are we can see the foramen of Monroe that is communicating with the right and left lateral ventricles respectively then we can identify the columns of the fornix columns of the fornix then here you can see the anterior commissure anterior commissure the commissure fibers which we can find that are passing through that and then this is the lamina terminalis so these are the structures which are present at the anterior wall interventricular foramen of Monroe then you can see the columns of fornix then anterior commissure then lamina terminalis now coming to the posterior wall posterior wall is extending from suprapineal recess suprapineal recess superiorly and then to the aqueduct of sylvius inferiorly this is suprapineal recess and here you can see the aqueduct of sylvius now what are the structures can be seen in the posterior wall are suprapineal recess then you can identify the habenular commissure. Can you see the dotted line here? Just behind the five number, you can find the habenular commissure. Then you can identify the pineal body and its recess. Then posterior commissure. Then aqueduct of sylvius. So these are the structures can be seen in the posterior wall. Now coming to the roof. Roof is extending from interventricular foramen of Monroe to the suprapineal recess so this is all forming the roof of the third ventricle so from the interventricular foramen of Monroe to the suprapineal recess the roof is extending so the roof has four separate layers one is neural layer then telochoroidea and then vascular layer so under the neural layer the telochoroidea is arranged in the two layers then under the telochoroidea we can identify the vascular layer here you are seeing the telochoroidea the dotted red color line now coming to the floor of the third ventricle it is contributed this where to where it is extending is from the optic chiasma here from the optic chiasma to the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius so this is forming the floor of the third ventricle now what the structures can be seen here are optic chiasma then infundibulum there is a stock of pituitary gland tuber cinerum posterior perforated sub mammillary bodies then posterior perforated substance and the tegment of midbrain so these structures you can understand better when you look at the brain from the inferior view so let us see that so here what are the structures can be seen from anterior to posterior so this is the optic chiasma behind that you can identify the stack of pituitary gland so here we are seeing into the pituitary gland above it you can identify the stack of pituitary gland now behind that infundibulum there you can identify between these two mammillary bodies at the midline you can identify the tuber cinerum and these are the two mammillary bodies behind that you can identify the posterior perforated substance then here you can identify the tegmentum of midbrain now we are going to see the right and left lateral walls so what are the lateral walls are contributed by so the lateral walls are contributed by medial aspect of thalamus and hypothalamus those two parts are separated by hypothalamic sulcus so as i am telling you this picture is not clearly showing that so i am going to take a section of the brain sagittal section in order to see this intothalamic adhesion hypothalamic sulcus thalamus and the hypothalamus now this is the picture showing the medial uh, sagittal section of the brain where we can identify this particular part the lateral wall of the third ventricle so this is one lateral wall on other half we can identify another lateral wall so here you can identify the interthalamic adhesion this particular oval body is nothing but the thalamus underneath it you can identify the sulcus this is called as hypothalamic sulcus below that this particular area where we can find the hypothalamus now this is the dissected image clearly you can find this is the interthalamic adhesion and this is the thalamus and this is a hypothalamic sulcus and underneath it you can identify the hypothalamus now we are going to see the medial aspect of right and left thalamus and the hypothalamus respectively 
now moving to the recess of the third ventricle what is the recess so the there are different recess can be seen there are five recess can be seen the folds can be seen in the third ventricle let us see from one by one first one is infundibular recess where we can find that the stack of pituitary gland where we can find the first recess that is infundibular recess now we are moving in a clockwise direction so that we can see all the recess so first one is infundibular recess second one is opticasmatic recess the third one is anterior recess where it is exactly present behind the anterior commissure then suprapineal recess over here just above the pineal gland then then we can find in the pituitary in the pineal gland where we can find the pineal recess this is how there are five recesses can be seen from anterior to posterior in a clockwise direction so roof our roof is lined by epidermal cells that stretches across the upper limits of the two thalami upper limits of the two thalami now moving to the fourth ventricle so we have discussed about this particular small structure now we are going to discuss about this structure called as fourth ventricle so what is fourth ventricle is so this fourth ventricle is a cavity which is present between the pons and the middle oblongata and the middle oblongata so pons and the middle oblongata they are present anteriorly and behind posterior to this fourth ventricle we can identify the cerebellum and what is the shape of it is it is a diamond shaped cavity of hind brain lined by ependyma now coming to the communications of this fourth ventricle here you can see this is the fourth ventricle as we have discussed anteriorly we can identify the pons and the middle oblongata posteriorly we can find the cerebellum now it is communicating above with the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius and below it is communicated with the central canal central canal of medulla oblongata here you can see the medulla oblongata behind that we can find the central canal so the fourth ventricle above communicating with the third ventricle below it is communicating with the central canal now below and behind below and behind we, we, it is going to communicate with the subarachnoid space called as cisterna magna cisterna magna so posteriorly it is going to communicate below and behind it is going to communicate with the subarachnoid space that is cisterna magna through a foramen called as foramen of megande foramen of megande here you can identify this particular uh, cistern called as cisterna magna there is a biggest cistern in our previous class we have we have done a short video which is telling about the cisterns so on each side on each side we can find in front in front with the cistern of pontus you can find here you can see the cistern of pontus that is going to communicate the cistern of pontus through the lateral apertures of lushka here you can identify the lateral apertures of lushka right and left lateral apertures of the lushka now here you can identify clearly the foramen of megande here you can see that there is a foramen of megande this is the largest cistern cerebellomedullary cistern cisterna magna now moving to the recess of the fourth ventricle as we have discussed the recess of the third ventricle we are going to see the recess of the fourth ventricle so what are the recess can be seen first one is one dorso median recess and two dorso lateral recess and then here you can identify the lateral recess two lateral recess two dorso lateral recess and one dorso median recess the two lateral recess or one on each side extends laterally in the interventral inter interval between the inferior cerebellar peduncle inferior cerebellar peduncle of flocculus dorsale here and here you can identify the inferior cerebellar peduncle over here and here you can see the flocculus of, of flocculus of cerebellum dorsale now the lateral extremity of the recess reaches up to the flocculus here you can see it is extend up to, up to the flocculus then and opens into the subarachnoid space opens into the subarachnoid space of a cerebello ponotine angle cerebello ponotine angle as the lateral aperture of foramen of lushka here you can identify this is the lateral aperture of lushka foramen of lushka through which the part of the choroid plexus bulges out 
by the south. Now moving to the dorsal median races. Dorsal median races. So where exactly the dorsal median races is present over here? So the a median part which is extending into the cerebellum that is called as dorsal median races. So that is extending up to the nodule of the cerebellum. Now coming to the angles of the fourth ventricle. This first one is superior angle. It is continuous with the cerebral aqueduct of midbrain. Then inferior angle, which is going to continue with the central canal, close the close the middle oblongata. Lateral angles uh, extend laterally to the form a lateral recess on each side to open into the subarachnoid space. Now moving to the lateral boundaries. So the superior lateral boundary, superior lateral boundary formed by superior cerebellar peduncle, superior cerebellar peduncle on each side. Now inferior inferior lateral boundary, inferior lateral boundary is formed by inferior cerebellar peduncle, inferior cerebellar peduncle, and gracile tubercle, and the cuneate tubercles are on each side, gracile tubercle and the cuneate tubercles on each side. Now coming to the roof, roof of the fourth ventricle, where it is ex exactly extending is, so it is coming, it is formed, contributed by superior medullary vein. Superior medullary velum. Here you can identify the superior medullary velum. It is connecting the uh, two superior cerebellar peduncles. Then the inferior medullary velum, which is connects the two inferior uh, cerebellar peduncles. Now moving to the floor of the fourth ventricle. This is very important topic which usually the medicine students in their first year they may get it for five marks question in their examinations the floor of fourth ventricle so it is a bit complicated structure which is consisting of so many parts now we are going to simplify and try to see one by one so it is a rhomboid fossa it is a rhomboid fossa shape of the floor of fourth ventricle is a rhomboid fossa that is communicated it is uh, right and left halves can be seen right and left halves can be seen those halves are separated by the median sulcus here you can see the median sulcus now the stria medullaris stria medullaris divide the floor of fourth ventricle into two areas upper part is the pontine part lower part is called as medullary part as the upper part is contributed by the posterior surface of the pons and lower part is contributed by the posterior surface of medulla oblongata so the median sulcus which is going to separate the two halves at the midline and here you can see the stria medullaris now we are going to discuss about the upper part called as ponotine part so what are the structures can be seen so this upper part ponotine part we are going to discuss about one half here okay so let us see that so the first one is sulcus limitants so the sulcus limitants which is separating the half into two areas so the lateral area and medial area medial area is called as medial eminence and lateral area is called as vestibular area medial eminence and lateral area lateral a1 is called as vestibular area that is separated by sulcus limitants now above the vestibular area we can find the depression that is called as superior fovea above the vestibular area the triangular shaped area that is called as superior fovea now in the median eminence medial eminence we can find there is a uh, the prominent area this prominent area is called as facial colliculus facial colliculus so this facial colliculus is consisting of abducent nucleus inside and that is covered by internal genu of the facial nerve genu means the curved bend Genu means the curved bend. You can see in the carpus callosum part. So here also you can identify internal curved fibers of facial nerve is exactly present just below this facial colliculus area. Then inside the internal genu fibers where we can find the abducent nucleus. Now above the medial eminence where we can identify the locus ceruleus. So this locus ceruleus which is responsible for the paradoxical sleep paradoxical sleep so that for, on that we are going to uh, perform we are going to uh, do a, another video on that locus ceruleus so we'll wait for that video in the next class hopefully so these are the structures once again
can see that uh, lateral area called as vestibular area, medial eminence, then above the superior fovea in the medial eminence, facial colliculus, then locus serratus. Now, as I said you earlier, here you can see that. So, this is how the obtusal nucleus is present that is covered by internal genu. Here you can see the internal genu of the facial nerve. This is the transverse section of the pons where we can find the obtusal nucleus and the facial nerve nucleus. So, when you try to see from where exactly these nerves are emerging at the ponto medullary junction, from medial to lateral, we can identify the sixth, seventh, and eighth cranial nerves respectively from medial to lateral abducent, facial and the vestibular cochlear nerves. Now we are going to see the lower medullary part. So this stria medullaris below the stria medullaris this particular part is called as medullary part. So this medullary part what are the structures can be seen in the medullary part from medial to lateral again we are going to see so median sulcus can be seen here. It is a same extension where we can find in the upper pontine part. There is the same sulcus which is extending here also. Same separating into two halves, right and left halves. So in the right, we are going to see in this particular half. So in one half, again the sulcus limitants which you have seen earlier in the upper part, that same sulcus limitants, limitants which is extending down here. So below also it is extending. At the lower end of the sulcus limitants, where we can find there is a small depression, that part is called as inferior fovea. This is called as inferior fovea. That sulcus limitants, which is going to separate this area, lower part one half into again same two areas, medial and lateral area. So the medial area is called as hypoglossal triangle. This part is called as hypoglossal triangle where we can find the hypoglossal nerve nucleus can be seen here you can see this is the transverse section at the level of medulla oblongata where we can find the hypoglossal nucleus is present here yeah now laterally what we can find is the so this lateral part which is consisting of the uh, vestibular nucleus can be seen vestibular nucleus so there are four nucleus four nucleus four groups of vestibular nucleus can be seen in the lateral area so superior inferior medial and lateral vestibular nucleus can be seen in this vestibular area now we are going a little down so the vestibular area extends along the lateral recess of the ventricle where the dorsal cochlear nucleus projects as an auditory tubercle auditory tubercle so remember this particular part which is consisting of vestibular nucleus medial part is consisting of hypoglossal nerve nucleus so below the inferior fovea and intervening between the hypoglossal triangle and the vestibular area there lies a triangular area called as vagal trigone try to observe this this is the vest uh, hypoglossal and this is the vestibular below that we can identify this area is called as vagal trigone now observe carefully in this vagal trigone where we can find there is another structure which is separating the vagal trigone into two areas that is called as funiculus separanus. This funiculus separanus is separating the vagal trigone into upper triangular area that is called as vagal triangle. Lower part is called as area postrema. Area postrema. So what is present here in the area postrema and what is present in the vagal triangle? In the vagal triangle, the name itself it is giving you an idea that dorsal nucleus of vagus, which is present here in this vagal nerve nucleus, then what is present in the area posterior is it is highly composed of vascular, neuroglial, and neuronal tissue, and it is devoid of blood brain barrier. Devoid of blood brain barrier. So, this is one neat question. So, the part of the medulla oblongata which is Mm, uh, devoid of blood brain barrier is nothing but the area postrema. So, which is uh, that is very important thing, and it is the electrophysiological study suggests that area postrema is closely related to the vomiting and respiratory centers. Remember that area postrema is consisting of vomiting and respiratory centers. So, in the upper part, we have seen the paradoxical sleep locus ceruleus. Remember that. 
So these are the important parts which are present in this lower part. So these are the st structures you have to remember. Okay. So in this dissected image specimen, we can find clearly this is the pons. Behind the pons, you can identify upper pontine part. Lower part is called as medullary part. And now this is how the right and left lateral ventricles are going to communicate with this third ventricle through interventricular foramen of Monroe. Third and the fourth ventricles are communicated through aqueduct of Sylvius. Now after that, so here is so anteriorly you can see the foramen of Lushka and then foramen of Magandi posteriorly. Now moving to the applied aspects of applied aspects of uh, uh, ventricles, third and fourth ventricles. Uh, first one is hydrocephalus so hydrocephalus is caused by impaired cerebrospinal fluid production the impaired flow or impaired reabsorption so the flow obstruction uh, hindering free passage of cerebrospinal fluid through ventricular system and subarachnoid space example stenosis of a cerebral aqueduct of sylvius or obstruction of the interventricular foramen of Monroe. So, a secondary to the tumors and hemorrhages or congenital malformations can be seen. So, this is how the CS of circulation can be seen from the choroid plexus, then to the lateral ventricles, to the, to the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe, then from third ventricle to the fourth ventricle through the aqueduct of sylvius, from that again to the anterior lateral, you can see the foramen of Lushka, it enters, then posteriorly dorsal median recess. That is for a man of Magandi, then inter, enters to the central canal. So after that, it, it baths entire the brain. Then it is passing through the central canal and passing through the spinal cord. This is how it is entering and covering entire the brain and the spinal cord. We are going to have a separate class on the CS of circulation. Then you will understand clearly. So this is another picture to show how the CSF is flowing from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle from the third to the fourth to the fourth from the fourth to the uh, central canal and then entire the cerebellum is bathing bathed by it and then after that enter the cerebrum is going to covered by this csf so this is a schematic diagram to show you how the CF, csf is uh, flowing in the ventricles Thank you, dear students. See you soon with a new class.